Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> My name is uh, Venkat Venkata Subramanian. I'm a professor of chemical engineering at uh, Columbia University in New York. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, the plenary speaker of today, Professor Kaming Ng of the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Professor Kaming Ng is chair professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. From 1980 to 2000, he was a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He joined the Hong Kong Department in 2000 and served as the head from 2002 until 2005. He was also CEO of the Nano and Advanced Materials Institute, a government-funded R&D center from 2006 to 2013. He served as corporate science and technology advisor for the Mitsubishi Chemical Japan from 2001 to 2013. He held uh, visiting positions at uh, DuPont, MIT, and the National Institute of Singapore. His research interests center on product conceptualization, process design, and business development involving water, natural herbs, nanomaterials, and various advanced materials. He's an editor or an editorial member <coughs> of various journals. Professor Ng is the recipient of the General Electric Outstanding Teaching Award. He's also a fellow of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, where he received the Excellence in Process Development Research Award in 2002. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Ng for the plenary lecture. Please join me in giving a hand welcoming him. <clears throat> Um, thank you for the kind introduction and for giving me the opportunity to share with you my view on product design. And um, I would like to begin by uh, acknowledging my collaborators. The work has been done in uh, Hong Kong, in the Technical University of Denmark, as well as the R&D Center in Hong Kong. Th this is the outline. We will talk about the products in the chemical supply chain, classifying them by type and by market sector. Then we talk about the tasks in the uh, product design framework and the elements that are used to execute those tasks in the design framework. We will uh, emphasize one element of the, of the framework, the grand product design model, and we will use three examples to illustrate the concepts in this framework. The products in the chemical supply chain, there are thousands and thousands of them. They all derive from nature, water, gas, oil, minerals, and plants and animals. If you look at the middle of the um, chemical supply chain, we are talking about B2B products, selling by one company to another. And an example is parasiline um, that you can see there in the middle, and uh, terephthalic acid to polyester. But there are many products that are also B2C products, where the consumers have a large say in what the products should be. Many of these B2B products are molecular products. Some are very common, the silos, PVB, but there are also functional molecules, such as the silo in the middle, and that would emit light under application. And also we have nanomaterials. And I actually synthesized one of them myself, uh, this one here. 
It took us two years and two postdocs to show that this molecule indeed works, and it would offer a ener an energy conversion efficiency as an electron acceptor in all organic PV. Now, the reason that I emphasize this point is in molecular design, collaboration with a chemist is very important. Now, if we look at the B2C products, some are molecules, but most of them are not. And we can classify them in different ways. One is what we refer to as chemical device. They are products that achieve certain objectives by, per, per, by performing reactions, fluid flow, heating, cooling. Examples include water filter and air purifier that we use at home. And these type of devices, we can consider them as miniature chemical plant. We look at the second type, functional products. These are the products made up of materials that perform a desired function. Skin care creams and food packaging are examples. If we look at the third type, are the um, formulated products. So this is, these are obtained by mixing selected components together to get the desired product attributes. And shampoos, adhesives are examples. So the way we approach these consumer center products is by looking at all these products, by classifying them, and look at them in different market sectors. And here we have agriculture, automotive, building and construction, electronics, and so on. Let's look at one um, in more detail. For the personal care, healthcare, and medical products, we have API. For devices, we have medical diagnostic kits, I can tell you. When we look at the design of these kits, a lot of chemical engineering principles have to be used. And we have di dialysis device, and the rest, transthermal patch, toothbrush, disposable diapers, they are functional products. For fem form formulated products, on the right, we have sunscreen lotion, hairspray, fabric softener, and so on. B2B products and B2C products, despite the fact that they all come from nature, they are significantly different. If we compare them one by one, the consumers for the B2C products are consumers, and the, for product design, we emphasize ingredients and uh, structures. The product lifetime is in terms of month or year instead of decades for B2B products. And because we have to deal with the consumers, a multidisciplinary team is required to design and to launch the product. Now, as you will see later on, that we, for B2C products, we tend to deal with unconventional processing techniques such as granulation, milling, nanomization, and so on. So the traditional chem and UOs uh, are not used that much. Now, and for the technical fo focus, we look at quality, performance, and we will look, look at profit for B2C products. It, the whole, this field, in a way, was set in motion. Uh, about 15 to 17 years ago. Ed Kessler and uh, George Stephanopoulos, at that time he was still at Mitsubishi. And I still remember that he asked me to give a talk about product design in Mitsubishi. And we have Jimmy Wei, Michael Hill, among many other people. Indeed, after that, we have published textbooks and uh, this, uh, these are some of the textbooks with product design in it to different extents. And by now, many of our seniors would know the four-step procedure proposed by Kessler and Morridge, the needs, ideas, 
selection and manufacture. Now, did we make a good decision in, mo in moving into this area, in spending all our time and effort 17 years ago? I did a survey of company websites, annual reports, and look at the business plan. This is a typical example from DuPont. Once you open the website, you can see they, tr they try to promote the products that they want to sell to you, along with the solutions to the problem. So if you keep clicking, then you look at uh, the packaging uh, materials. If you pick another the active uh, package, then you will see the specific product. And if you look at the annual report, that is the annual report for 2012, then you can see they are, they are saying that in 2012, they launched, commercialized over 2,000 new products that year. That means that you are talking about almost five new products per day. And it was also stressed that 29% of the, their sales were derived from products launched in the previous four years. This was not a one-off deal. You can see that in, that is the latest. In 2013, basically, we got the same message. So when I work with many companies in Hong Kong and beyond, this is the message that I want to uh, share with you. With the information flow that we have today, for SMEs, small companies, and for multinational companies alike, everyone is saying that in order to get the high profit margin that the companies desire, it's not easy at all. And in, in fact, it's a matter of survival to keep on coming, uh, on keep on generating new products and new services. And there are many examples that would come to mind right away. So it's clear that for product design, uh, for product development and design, somehow we have to learn to do it expeditiously and effectively in order to survive. So the question then is, what needs to be done in product design to meet these needs? Now, we have been doing for a long time already that we do what to, we, lo we learn how to make and how, uh, what to make and how to make. We focus on consumer preferences and quality of the product. But that is not enough as this community community knows full well that even if we have the product in mind, we know how to make it, it doesn't mean that we have to do it. Then we have to look at the profit to look at whether or not we can make money out of it. And if we do want, want to go ahead with the product, then how do we do it efficiently? Now, in order to make decisions for all these four points, we propose a multidisciplinary hierarchical framework um, for executing this decision making. Now, there are 10 tasks in the framework. They are market study, project management, feasibility stud study, in addition to product design itself, and economic analysis. These 10 tasks cover job functions ranging from management to economic and, uh, um, and finance. Now, some people may say, are you good going to be an accountant? No. What we try to say is that we would like to make sure that technology is fully captured in product design, along with people in other disciplines. So these tasks are subdivided into subtasks. And I know that it's too small for you to, to read, 
So these are all the ta uh, subtasks that we have to do, and there are actually uh, more subtasks. Uh, Let's look at one at least, market study, that we would like to collect consumer per, uh, preferences, identify the product attributes. Now, the way we do it, if we look at the, go to the website, you can find something. But in the end, we actually depend on the investment community. They have in-depth reports of the any market sector of different products. And I can tell you that in working with them, the, the, those product uh, reports inevitably were prepared by people with a technical background. Of course, we can leave marketing plan, test marketing to the business people. So now we have the tasks and let's look, we have also the elements to execute these tasks and there are five types of them. The first one is rule-based methods, such as quality function deployment, design procedures, they are all there. And we have model-based methods, pricing model, transport models. For, um, for B2C products, transport phenomena are, play a very significant, significant role in design. Then we have the tools that you are familiar with, databases, and it's not common to, to do so in this community. We need experiments in designing B2C products. So let's look at some examples for rule-based uh, 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 methods. This is the so-called obje objective time chart. At the top, we have the um, objective, the overall objective, and as you can see for D, the ob objective is divided into sub-objective and then into sub-objectives. Each box in this so-called, uh, this Gantt chart or ob ob objective time chart has different elements in it. And that is when we execute this ob objective time chart, we identify the resources, the activities, time, tools, input in output information uh, in for each objective. Now, this might s seem simple, but I got, I, these ideas were inspired by my colleague at DuPont. Uh, he was the team leader to execute a project. By knowing what to do at the right time, he was able to execute that project exceedingly efficiently. And that is where I got the ideas. And another example for rule-based methods for business and marketing. This is the QFD. But for chemical product design that has been modified, we go from product attributes, the first, uh, the first uh, square, to product, to product ingredients and microstructure, then process design and call it by design. And we organize all the uh, elements below it to execute each step of the QFD. Now, let's turn our attention to um, formulated products. This is the conventional uh, method for doing um, formulated, for designing formulated products. We begin with a base case, we experimentally iterate, and then do performance test to come up with the formulated product. But the search clearly is inefficient and the search space is limited in size. So what we have done is we decided that we would like to combine computer-aided um, design along with the experiments. So in this example, for an inset repellent spray, we look at the evaporation time, the to toxicity, solubility, viscosity, and molar volume to come up with the final formula for the inset repellent spray. Now, of course, I skip all the details, but it's not so important. It's much more important to understand the strategy behind it. On the top, we have the um, traditional method for designing formulated products. Below is what we aim to do. 
We would like to do it by virtual reality, by computations only. But it may not be reliable. So what you saw before is the strategy that we used. That is, we use experiments to provide realistic model parameters, use the simulations to guide the experiments, and use the experiments to verify our solutions. That was what we have been doing. So therefore, we integrate modeling, experiments, and synthesis to come up with innovative, yet realistic, commercializable products. So this is another procedure, but for functional product, for example, a hand cream. So what we have here is the, uh, we begin with the product attributes, go through the procedure using elements in the framework that we have accumulated to come up with the material type microstructure of the product. And this example of the cream product that the consumer expects that it is smooth, it flow well, but doesn't drip. So for that, we need a shear thinning uh, product with uh, all the numbers are from heuristics in the framework, and we need an emulsion with a particle size of about five micron, so it would feel smooth. Now, let's skip the uh, selection of materials here. Let's go right to the selection of flow, sh flow sheet structure. So in a way, we have the superstructure from our flow sheet database. And uh, on, at the top, we pre-mix the ingre ingredients by whether it's oil phase, insoluble, or the water phase. Then, then we mix them, and then we carry out homogenization. With this type of flow sheet database, it's relatively straightforward to come up with the flow sheet that is specific to the hand cream we have in mind, as, as well as the operating conditions. And we also have the equipment database. And this is, uh, shows the energy uh, required as well as the capacity. We have agitated vessel, color meal, uh, the, uh, the pressure homogenizer. So using heuristics, for this uh, five-ton production, we pick agitated vessel and the color meal. And we have to go into transport phenomena. That we are in such uh, equipment pieces, we are talking about the competition between breakage and coalescence. So we have included all the uh, mechanistic models and used them to design the mixing tank and the color mill. Now, I've been looking at what our community is doing in product design. Actually, I just listened to the talk. I, can, I begin to feel that this talk on mayonnaise, we are moving in a very similar direc direction, indicating that the community is converging to a certain direction. And I would like to offer a different view of what we just said. We begin with, in, let's look at the talk. We begin with ingredients and process design. So ingredients determine the material property and the Process and ingredients determine the product structure and the product quality. Now, a, a property model can be any thermodynamic property model, but since I work with uh, DTU, uh, we use ICAS. But how do we, now we have the, the product, how do we know that we make money out of it? For that, we have to t take it further. To look at the product cost, that is determined by the ingredient, the bomb, and the process design, as well as non-manufacturing costs. Now, that would determine the cost, but that doesn't tell me the profit. For that, we need a pricing model to look at the market, to look at the price that I want to charge to get the maximum benefit. And with that, I can look at the economic potential in terms of uh, net present value or uh, internal rate of return. Now, in addition, we have to look at product use conditions. A cream, you have to apply it. That's easy. But I just, 
rather than using my own example, where, which I prepare inkjet ink, uh, I look at another talk, the working fluid, that it depends on where the working fluid is used in, or, in order to define the product quality. So let's move on, that there are other factors really to consider as well. We would like to uh, uh, leverage the company expertise and resources. We have to meet societal needs. We have to look at the global supply chain as well as government regulations and incentives. At the bottom, it shows that for the renewable energy, without government subsidy, it's not, we are not going anywhere. So this has to be incorporated into our design, product design model. So this kind of completes what I would like to uh, tell you. And but that we need to do multi-objective op optimization along with all the other property, uh, all the other models that we just talked about. This is a summary. But the important point is that in the way we deal with this grand product design model, the transformation is not just equations alone. We use our know-how, our database, our connection to make decisions. So in a way, I don't know how to do it, but it's a combination of decision-making, computation, experiments to execute this grand product design model. For me, since I work with many companies uh, working on real products, that is the way we make it, we make it uh, we design the product in short time and that can make money for the company. Now, let's look at an example that we have already commercialized. Uh, this is the uh, LED light and uh, the gallium light chip is the middle. It emits blue light with the phosphor, the, we get the yellow and we get white. Now, the chip is attached to the substrate by what we call the dye-attached adhesive. Now, the light conversion efficiency for this LED chip is about 50% give and take. So what it means is that 50% of the remaining energy is converted to heat, pretty hot, up to about 110 degrees C at the junction. So we did a dye-attached adhesive with this structure to move the heat away. So we have a polymer matrix, which is epoxy, and we have silver microparticles, or we also call them silver uh, flakes, in the dye-attached adhesive. Now, we went through all the competitive analysis. So this is part of the method that we use in this design framework. So without going into all the details, I highlighted two. Well, in any product design, you make it better and you make it cheap, okay? So there are only two issues. So that, these are we aim for now. So the idea that now, that is important to come up with the innovative solutions. So we decided that maybe we can put nano rod and nano silver particles into the dye attached adhesive. The thermal conductivity would go up without using a lot of silver. Did we make it? Well, before we do it, this, this was a one-year project at the R&D, uh, Leno R&D Center. So this is the uh, objective time chart. I'm not going to go over it. Now, it turned out, despite years of effort on chemical engineering sciences, I did not know how to do it. They asked me, and at the end, that's how we did it. That we size the filler, we pick the filler size, that is the silver nanoparticle size, surface modification, vacuum drying, we formulate the epoxy and mix them. But think about it, you have to mix it in such a way that they would distribute uniformly. That turned out not to be easy. It took the chemist and her team three full months to get a protocol to work. And that is reported in the patent. Now, so this here I show you examples. S1 is the 80% by weight of the original uh, DAA. 
if I add uh, uh, 10% silver flake, that is micro particles, it would increase by to 13.12, 30%. But if I, rather than using micro particles, I use nano particles, S4, sample S4, then you can almost double the thermal conductivity without, you, but using the same amount of silver. And this is an SEM picture. Now, we know that we have, we, have, we have something that works. How can we maximize the profit? And that is what we do. Now we go back to the grand product design model. We would like to maximize the NPV subject to property is easy, that uh, we can calculate the polymer thermal conductivity from ICAS. We look at the cost model. For the process model, it turns out, as you, I, I mentioned before, no model for mixing. It's too hard. We don't understand the chem and sciences deep enough. So the idea is to use the experimentally proven mixing process and assume that the microstructure uh, remains unchanged. All right, That's what we did. And we did a quality model now. The quality model depends on two things the microstructure and the amount of silver nanoparticles in the DAA. So we came up with a correlation based on the experimental data and a better analysis. That's how we did. And this is an easy problem that at the top, we, what you see on the figure is the top of the DAA and the bottom of the DAA, the film, about 15 micron thick. So we assume that it is made up of identical unit cells, solve a very simple um, thermal steady state thermal conduction problem. But now we have to come up with many different configurations, the way the microstructure would look like. I show you two, but we have many more. All right? That uh, we, in these two configurations, the nanoparticles are uniformly distributed in the interstitial void space of the DAA among the microparticles. Now, then, uh, this is a typical uh, uh, simulation on the left. Then, I go back to sample S1, S3, and S4. S1, you can see that we only have microparticles. The match is pretty good, meaning that, indeed, in the DAA, the microparticles are uniformly distributed. Nice, all right? And if we go to S4, now if we add 10% of nanoparticles to the DAA, now the experimental data is 21, which is good. I like it because it doubled the thermal conductivity. But it shows that the calculated thermal conductivity on the right is much higher, showing that in terms of microstructure, the nanoparticles are not uniformly distributed as I imagined. But anyway, we based on the experimental data and this less than perfect distribution, we, can, we use the correlation and move on. For the pricing model, um, we look at the uh, total market size, the competitor's um, uh, uh, product. Alpha, you can see in the equation, reflects the consumers are aware less of the new product. You know, you sell something, you have to let them know. And uh, it would correlate with the marketing effort that we put in, in terms of advertisement. And the way we did it was we sent our uh, project managers to different companies to show the product to them. Now, for the economic model, we look at NPV is just capital budgeting process that uh, we look at the development cost and we look at the uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, project cash flow from year to year, and uh, with the additional uh, constraint, oh, by the way, uh, I use the pricing model from a colleague uh, indicated there. With that then, we can come up with the optimization results. Uh, we look at two design variables, the product price and the amount of nanoparticle in the DAA. So it shows that the product price should be set at around four US dollars per gram, and the uh, product amount 
would be two ton per year, and the composition is indicated there. It turns out I was really happy to learn that the composition is not that far away from uh, what the chemist proposed to me when we decided what to sell. So it's amazing that in using common sense and the computations uh, effort that we put in, they do agree. Now, oh, by the way, uh, it's not emphasized, but when we do commercial product, the product quality is exceedingly important. So we went through all the ISO tests in order to sell the product, and that is indicated there. Now, to conclude, that, well, as I listened to different talks to this morning, uh, as I showed there, that I feel that after 17 years, the community is converging to a view of product design, be it B2B or B2C. And I, I, I propose that uh, this uh, design framework with a few em emphasis. And these are, number one, collaboration of people outside of PSG, and maybe even outside of CAMN, uh, is a key to designing a commercializable product. So I would like to encourage that. Product conceptualization now. I did not emphasize enough. I use only one slide, but I spend a lot of time in product conceptualization, looking at the market, looking at different product, uh, product types, in order to identify a product that I want to go for. Because once you do it, it's a long journey. It's a lot of investment. So the screening at the very beginning is very important. Integration of experiments and modeling is important in product design. And I'd like to emphasize that we cannot sell something that is not reliable. And project management, it will make day and night if we have to include all the technical how in project management to do it properly. Now, a recommend, recommendation for further work. Uh, one is to determine the property material structure processing relationship. I still remember that almost 20 years ago, it was a workshop organized by uh, John Willison of DTU at Port Sunlight, a, a, a Unilever site on exactly on this topic. But even today, as you can see, I don't think that we have the tools to predict uh, this relationship. Now, as we go forward, I, the reason that I show the slide on the different market sectors is that if we are going to make an impact, we have to be very specific and we have to have all the details. So we, I would like to suggest that we develop the elements whatever method, experiments, um, and, uh, uh, and so on, for different market sectors. And in the Netherlands, uh, foods have been emphasized. And the grand product design model can be further explored computationally. For in this community, we are good in doing that. And many insights and trade-offs are not clear yet, particularly for B2C products. And another one that has bothered me for a long time is the, the uh, the, the, when we come, uh, is the traditional CAM and unit operation that I learned many years ago. But when I look at the B2C products, coating, dispersion, lamination, breakage, the ones that I really do today, there are very few design equation for this unconventional processing techniques. Now, so product design and uh, entrepreneurship, I would like to say, say one thing, all right, that I do not know enough about uh, uh, Europe and back in the States, uh, what is happening. But in Hong Kong now, they realize that we can no longer do manufacturing alone. We have to have new products. And there are competitions all the time. The top, we are talking about consumer product design competitions. They get all our students and people to join in to do it. And below is a competition in my university. I actually, that was me. 
I actually got an innovation prize in that competition. And Jack Ma, uh, Alibaba, he uh, set aside one billion Hong Kong dollars for entrepreneurs in Hong Kong to develop new products. So I actually I can see, I look at Korea, I look at other places, the same is being repeated across Asia. Because of the information age, we have to move exceedingly quickly. So I feel that the future of chemical product design is bright. I mentioned something, but these are the things that we are doing at this mo right at this moment. Smart windows, thin, flexible battery, inkjet ink, and uh, uh, the LED. Oh, by the way, you can buy this LED on, uh, in uh, Amazon. So if you Google, you, you'll find it. And we look at adhesive, very many different types, opti optically clear adhesive, for example, and other devices. Now, then we may have to collectively, we want to ask ourselves a question. How do we know whether our community has made a difference in uh, product design? Well, I would like to uh, mention Jim Douglas, my uh, former colleague and mentor at UMass. And that's what he said. The best way to judge the impact of your, that doesn't mean me, everyone in the audience, whether or not your work is, uh, has, whether your, uh, your, uh, your work has made an impact, is to see whether your work is taught in the senior design course, because these seniors represent are the pr practitioners of our profession. So I'm hopeful, oh, by the way, probably uh, when he said that, we did not have H index at the time. <laughs> so uh, with that, I'm hopeful that as we move on, we can uh, see some of our work being taught at the undergraduate level. And with that, thank you for your, I, I'll stop and thank you for your listening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Koming. And uh, uh, we do have a few minutes for some questions. Uh, would you please uh, identify yourself and We'll have the pages uh, rush on microphone to you. Hi. This is a page of the University of Manchester, UK. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, I like your uh, proposed framework. It seems very powerful, and you seem to consider many aspects and parameters there. Now, one of the things that I believe is missing from your framework is um, sustainability assessment at the early design stage of products. You do consider economic analysis, but you don't seem to consider any environmental or even social aspects of um, product at the design stage. So I was wondering why that is so, particularly as we know that many companies and those that you work with consider sustainability as very important? Thank you. Um, yes and no. Um, we did uh, consider it. Oh, oh I have to, oh, right here. So uh, I did not really, uh, so no is that I did not write that down, but uh, these other factors include sustainability issues as well. Now, that is a very good question because you may ask the question, why do you wait until the end to consider it after designing the product? So I would, I would say that this framework, we don't follow every single step from beginning to end. So in a way, we do jump back and forth to consider different issues. So uh, it is considered. Uh, 
Okay. Um, Gabriela Henning, Intec Argentina. Thank you very Hi, much Henning. for your enlightening presentation and nice seeing you after a long time. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering, um, other sectors like the manufacturing and the software industry, in order to cope with issues like a short life cycle of products, are using mm -hmm. nowadays the concept of product platform. Uh, because mm -hmm. it, it allows you to, to shorten the times, uh, mm -hmm. to launch a, a whole bunch of products. Uh, are you using that concept too? Yes, absolutely. So uh, that was at the top, that um, we cannot do all things to all people. So, for example, I interact with a company in Hong Kong, and they manufacture uh, touch panels, and, uh, uh, and similar products. So like, for example, I don't know whether you know, many of your mobile phones are manufactured in Shenzhen, north of Hong Kong. So uh, we look, the way we look at it is, we, look, we have the uh, product platform, and then, but at the same time, we try to look ahead, because the world is really changing very fast, particularly for mobile phones. You may, it is cut flow competition for the mobile phone business. So we have our technology platform and the products that we make, and we try to branch out because if we don't, other people will. So, uh, uh, so we are constantly revising our technology platform in order to survive. <coughs> Stratos Pistikopoulos, Texas A&M. Uh, thank you very much for your very excellent presentation. I was wondering, uh, uh, I know you touched upon B2C primarily, but there is a class of very important products and materials where the interplay of uh, product, material, and process is critical. We can think of adsorbents, other things, and so forth. Can you perhaps comment on the grand framework for this type of materials where the process interplay is critical and what are the thoughts for research, outstanding research issues on this subject? Uh, as pointed out, that uh, we did consider the uh, microstructure, processing and material relationship. But as mentioned, I don't have a solution. So the way we do it is by hook or by crook. We come up with a way to deal with it. But uh, so I would really encourage uh, the audience, uh, uh, people in this audience, to uh, look into it. So at this moment in time, we cannot wait. We still move on, and we did that by experiments. That was the only way we know, we, we, we know how to proceed. Patrick Piccione from Syngenta. I was interested to see your grand framework where you've got uh, both, I guess, technical and then business uh, parts to the mathematical models. And what I was curious was how early in the uh, workflow can you use the structure of the problem to tell you where you should f focus company resource? Yeah. Um, I went on a training course where they had simulations of product development. It was designed by the marketers. It was completely stuck against me. Any dollar I put in R&D was useless, so we completely lost in the simulation as mm -hmm. a team. Yeah, this is an excellent question. Um, well, the answer to this question is, at the end, all our models, all our computations, what we get out, out of it is insight. Now, this, I got projects terminated because the business guy doesn't like it, right? Then I complained, why you don't like it? So I learned a lesson. The way I deal with them now is, I will be the business guy. I look at the whole picture myself, all right? So that I will not be caught by surprises now. And do I, should I do computation first or should I do something first? That I cannot help you. It comes with experience that by looking at enough examples, I learn along the way, but for because at this moment, I also, whenever there is a new, product, a new technology coming to the company, I am the one to review the technology to see whether or not I want to collaborate with them. 
So this really comes with experience, but I think the framework and the, the systematic approach that this community emphasize, emphasize would help to build up that experience over time quicker than otherwise. Marianne Thiera Petritu, uh, Radkes University. Thank you for your excellent talk. Uh, I was wondering about your comments regarding consideration of variability for all the different parameters that you are considering in order to reach the optimal solution. So in what uh, stage of your analysis you think that uh, like, uh, tools like sensitivity analysis will work uh, to your advantage to try to find where to focus the specific uh, resources? Yeah, thank you for the question. And we did look at sensitivity uh, for different products, but uh, turns out that in product design, I never have enough people. So, uh, for example, we try to do design on exp of experiment, but no one has the time to do the. D we have the software, we purchase it, but no one will do it. So, similar thing that if you ask me that uh, um, when to do the sensitivity analysis. Now, for example, this, in this case, we did that. We changed the, price, uh, the product price, we changed the silver uh, price, and so on. But we did that at the end. And should we do it earlier so I get a better feel? Uh, I do not know. That, in a way, it really depends on, I think once we have the framework there, with the information next to me, then it's up to the team to use a sense of direction uh, to go forward. So I guess at the end, uh, my boss always told me, uh, the boss in the company always told me, well, you know, coming and what we want you here because you can make decisions. So, uh, so I don't know when, how, but at the end, uh, we build up our confidence in, make, in deciding what to do as long as the whole framework is at your disposal. This is David Wong from Tsinghua University in Taiwan. I was wondering how much our traditional senior design course should be thrown away so that your materials can be included. Okay. <laughs> now, actually, I, 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 the reason that I leave the contact information to you is we developed course materials. We did many projects. I just taught two courses for graduates and undergraduates for product design project. All right. So we guided them through, showed them how to do it. So uh, we did cover everything that uh, for people who attended Jeff Soros' uh, presentation, we talked about residual curve map, everything also. But I don't know how, but somehow we managed to also assign them a project on product design, uh, designing disposable diapers. It turned out to be ex really, really interesting. I cannot wait to share this uh, with you. I'm now uh, writing it up that uh, I'll be happy to share uh, these case studies with you because it's, uh, it's, uh, we use that for undergraduates and for graduate students. I don't know whether I answer a question, but that is what, where we are. Uh, we walk out from uh, TU Dortmund. Uh, thanks for the very nice presentation. Uh, okay. I just uh, wants to know, okay, you in improve the performance, and but there is another problem with the uh, companies, is the read of a finished product. Could you comment? With I, I, could, I didn't get a question. About what finished product? Uh, the read of finished product. So the maybe how many to product the products in the production? Oh, how much to produce? No, it's the read of... Uh, I the percentage of a finished product. Yes. Oh, I, I know, the, for example, the yeah. iWatch. Okay, I'm yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, there are one problem with the rate of fi uh, finished product. It means you can make 100, but uh, you can only deliver maybe 60 to the customer because oh, only you mean some does not work. Uh, the quality. The issue. quality doesn't yeah. fit. Okay. All right. Now. He touched upon a, an issue that is really dear to my heart. Why? Because um, at the end of the um, production line, all the mobile phones, 
as they go through the line, or a battery that go through the line, uh, we do testing, all right? So the yield can kill you if you don't do it right. So we, uh, in a typical company for this type of manufacturing, we have a quality person checking uh, uh, the uh, bat battery or the mobile phone when they come out of production. Now, if you tell me that your yield is 60%, because by that time, you cannot revert it to the uh, mater original material. So I will kill you. You will be fired. All right? Why? Because 60% yield is not acceptable. We are, we are throwing money away. So uh, along, the, along the way, we do look at the design, the manufacturing process in great detail, way beyond what I understand. But we use automation, we, use, uh, uh, we check every step of the way as much as possible to get the yield as close to 100% uh, as possible. But it really depends on the, uh, on the product that you are talking about. For example, the OLED PV or some other products. Uh, well, it also depends on the competition. If the competition can have the yield of 60% and you get 70, then you are okay. Well, <coughs> on that encouraging note, uh, <coughs> <coughs> I've suddenly dis developed an enormous respect and admiration for calming students now. <laughs> so uh, I think it's, I don't want to be the guy standing between you and lunch. So please join me in thanking Professor Ming for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Yeah.